Okay, thank you so much for joining us again as we continue our study in the book of Proverbs. Um, we are uh, in the 29th chapter, and tonight we are ready to begin at uh, verse 12. You know, the Proverbs um, in some quarters have a bad reputation because they seem to some to be simplistic, even uh, to the point of being mundane routine, too obvious. One of my favorite presidents, I guess, I think he was an underrated president anyway, was Calvin Coolidge, uh, who uh, was in office about a hundred years ago. And Mr. Coolidge is not well thought of by uh, a lot of historians because they did not agree with his philosophy. Imagine that. And there view of Coolidge uh, is uh, low because Coolidge uh, was a man who believed that the government was not the answer to all the problems. In fact, in many cases it became a problem when it tried to take on too much. Um, this is not a political science lecture and I, I wouldn't be very good at that anyway. But uh, I bring all that up to, to say, and I've probably shared this with you before at some point, one of my favorite quotes from Coolidge uh, along this line went something like this. They criticized me for harping on the obvious. If all the folks in the United States would do the few simple things they know they ought to do, most of our big problems would take care of themselves. Whenever I, I hear the criticisms of the Proverbs, that they are uh, too mundane and too obvious, I, I think about that principle. Uh, they may be obvious, but they're not very often obeyed. They're not very often followed. The course of wisdom is not usually mysterious. It's just a question of whether or not we will determine to do the right thing. The Proverbs give us a good reminder about the right way, about the wise way, about the, the blessings that come from making the decision to do the right thing. So as we go through the Proverbs, we just keep that thought in mind. Uh, every one of these principles may not knock our socks off and say, wow, I never thought about that before. Sometimes I think the wise man certainly makes an application that um, uh, might not have been what I was thinking about or may not have been according to my practice, but it, it is the best way. And in some cases, it's just a matter of me surrendering to what I know is the best way. Proverbs 29 and verse 12 has something to say about uh, government and about the rule of government. Again, this is not a series about politics by any means, but uh, the Proverbs do speak to uh, human relationships, and that includes governing and being governed. And in this proverb, the wise man reminds us, if a ruler hearken to lies, all his servants are wicked. Now, what did he mean by that? Did he mean that uh, if the ruler somehow gets off the path, everybody automatically becomes a sinner? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's the idea at all. That wouldn't be fair, would it? But he's talking about a truism that uh, the king usually uh, leads in a way, and if he leads in the wrong way, very few people have the moral strength to buck that trend. Uh, some of the modern speech translations offer uh, these renderings. A ruler who listens to lies will have corrupt officials. If a ruler pay attention to false information, all his officials will be liars. If a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants become wicked. The idea being that not many will have the moral courage to stand for what's right against the wishes of someone with that kind of power. Uh, Kyle and Dalish in their comments on the passage offer this thought. They are so because they deceive him. In other words, they're wicked either because they're in the process of helping him be deceived by lying to him and leading him the wrong way for their own purposes. And they become so 
For instead of saying the truth, which the rulers does not wish to hear, they seek to gain his favor by deceitful flatteries, misrepresentations, exaggerations, and falsehood. So here are the servants that are wicked. They're wicked by misleading their ruler, or they're wicked because they don't have enough, we might put it crudely, guts to stand up against the tide and to uh, hold on to what's right. When we think about this principle, we see that it has a lot of applications outside of the, the uh, government realm. But one of the examples that comes immediately to mind, of course, uh, takes us back to the Old Testament. Um, in um, 1 Kings chapter 22, there is a, a story here concerning the uh, demise of King Ahab. Ahab was a, a wicked man. God had given him many opportunities to turn, and he was just too stubborn to do so. Uh, Jezebel, his wife, was a big influence on him, uh, and he was a big influence on the court of Israel. So, as as 1 Kings 22, you remember the story, we'll just give an abbreviated account. Uh, the Syrians had uh, taken a city over in Gilead that Ahab felt was rightly belonged to him. He was looking for help to retake the city from the Syrians, go to war with them over the city. And he appealed to the uh, kingdom of Judah. Their uh, captain, of course, their king was Jehoshaphat. He was, in many ways, a good man. His great weakness was that uh, he felt so much of a kinship because of, of blood relations and that he was uh, too soft-hearted toward a man like Ahab, who, though he may have been a son of Abraham, was no son of Abraham as far as his character was concerned. Uh, but anyway, he is appealed to by Ahab, will you help me take this city? And his response was, well, your people is my people. Uh, so, but he did say, uh, I'd like to hear from uh, the prophets of God. Well, the prophets up north were not really prophets of God. They were idolatrous prophets. They were compromised men in every way. Um, so in verse 6 of, of 1 Kings 22, the king of Israel gathered the prophets together about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth-Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Um, obviously, they knew what the king wanted to hear, and they told him exactly what he wanted to hear. Jehoshaphat wonders if there might not be somebody here who's not with this crowd, somebody who might be more we would say conservative, more orthodox, more loyal to the to Jehovah than these idolatrous priests. And the king of Israel admitted, well, there is one fellow. He said in verse 8, uh, a man named Micaiah, the son of Imla, uh, but uh, I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Uh, so here is an honest man. That's why he says, uh, I hate him. He doesn't tell me what I want to hear. So anyway, uh, Jehoshaphat rather insisted that we hear from this Micaiah, and they go and fetch him. And when they go and fetch him, uh, they give him instruction. Now, while they're doing that, uh, some of these false prophets, you know, are putting on their show. Uh, there was a man, verse 11, named Zedekiah, the son of Kaniana. Uh He made horns of iron. And uh, he said, with these shall thou prevail against the Syrians and push them until they've been consumed. All kind of very dramatic show there. Uh, now, this, uh, this fellow would be an example of the very kind of thing that Solomon is talking about. Of course, Solomon wrote the Proverbs many years prior to this particular Zedekiah, but we find that uh, principle in action. All the prophets, verse 12, prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead, prosper, the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And uh, the messenger, verse 13 says, that was gone to call Micaiah, uh, the honest man, spake unto him and gave him the, the word before that he got to the king. He said, Look, 
Behold now the words of the prophets declare good to the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them. Speak that which is good. So these uh, fellows got together with him and said, Look, you get in line with these other folks. The king wants to go. They're telling him to go. You tell him to go. So Micaiah gets up there before the king and he says, Go. <laughs> but he said it in such a way that it was obvious, that it was ironic, uh, sarcastic. And so Ahab responded. He said, I want you to tell me the truth. He said, you want the truth? Here's the truth. I see Israel scattered upon the hills like sheep, not having a shepherd, because they have no master. Well, Ahab was uh, smart enough to understand what that meant. It meant that the shepherd of Israel was not coming back from this battle. And he became enraged. He said, I told you. I told you this man was a... He just hates me. He won't say good things for me. And so um, he uh, had actually Micaiah arrested. He said, I want you to put him in prison and just feed him in bread and water till I come back in peace. And Micaiah, you remember, he said to the king, if you come back in peace, God hadn't spoken to me. So, of course, he didn't come back in peace. It was a disaster. And even though he tried to hide himself in the battle, he was struck by an arrow and he died, bled out there on the battlefield. Uh, it, it was uh, a disaster. All of it brought about by a stubborn man. Our point is how appropriate this proverb, how, how it's exemplified in this particular story. Uh, you just say what, what's popular. Say what people, say what the big man wants to hear. Uh, you find that in, uh, in government uh, to disastrous results. You find it in business to disastrous results. You find it in families. And you find it in the church. Uh, we remember that passage in 2 Timothy. Paul is writing to one of the finest young preachers that's ever been. And he charges him in this last letter written to Timothy, the last one we have from Paul. And he tells him there, preach the word, verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant, ready, in season and out of season. One old fellow explained it this way. He said that means you preach it when they like it and when they don't. <laughs> Hard to argue with that, uh, uh, with that exegesis. I think he's right about that. He says, Timothy, you tell the truth. Tell it when it seems in season and tell it when it's out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Notice, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll turn away from the truth and they uh, are turned to fables. He said, in the church, times are coming when people will not want to hear what's true. They won't tolerate it. Uh, they will pile up just a pile of teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. That will scratch their ears, as it were. Well, nothing new under the sun. And what I think the wise man is calling on us to do, whether we're in government or whether we're in the church or in wherever we are, is to be honest. Uh, I don't think he's calling on us to be know-it-alls. I don't think he's calling on us to be abrasive for its sake, just to be a contrarian. But to be honest, uh, one fellow wrote about our, our text there in, in Proverbs 29. Once a ruler begins to listen to lies, his court will be corrupted. Courtiers adjust themselves to the prince. When they learn that deception and court flattery win the day, they learn how the game is played. If you run anything, if you run a family, if you run a business, whatever it might be, uh, you can squelch honest disagreement to the point that the only people around you are folks who will say yes to whatever you think. But you will not have helped yourself. That's what Solomon reminds us of. And we dare not be a part of that chain. The ruler is willing to be deceived and does not care to hear the truth. So his servants flatter and lie to him. And the whole atmosphere is charged with unreality and deceit, misrepresentations, exaggerations, deceit, God forbid. So honor, honorable discussion, 
uh, the valuing of different opinions and views, uh, the valuing of, of criticism that's offered uh, to be constructive, whether it hits the mark or not, the ability to evaluate that, to see ourselves, to have our decisions questioned, that's a, that's a part of what it means to be wise. And that's why the wise man uh, makes this point for us. Okay, let's think about another in uh, Proverbs 29, verse 13. Here we find the poor and the deceitful man meet together. The Lord lighteneth both their eyes. That's an interesting passage. The poor and the deceitful man meet together. I think you have here the two extremes. Two men on the opposite ends of the spectrum. The poor man very strong word. We've seen it before in Proverbs. A word which really suggests the idea of someone who's just destitute, really on the bottom end of things. And then you have a deceitful man, which seems to be implied here that this is a fellow who might be cheating the poor man, uh, or in some way mistreating him, uh, oppressing him. That's wrapped up likewise uh, in the literal meaning of this word. Uh, let both of these individuals, the, the man on the bottom and the man who might be abusing him and pushing him to the bottom, let both of them remember that the Lord lightens the eyes. That is, gives light. Um, the, the light of life, I think, is what he has in mind particularly. You can find that expression to enlighten or lighten uh, in uh, several Old Testament passages, and we'll not take time to go back and look at all those, but if you really have a further question about that phrase, I think in 1 Samuel 14 and Psalm 13, uh, it, it's really the idea of being enlivened, uh, being given life, brought back to life. <clears throat> in Proverbs 29, 13, the oppressor, literally the man of oppressions, is paired with the poor man as a recipient of God's even-handed blessing, emphasizing the fact that all people owe their existence to him. So what the wise man is reminding us of is that uh, wherever we might fit on this scale, if we're the one getting the bad end or if we're the one who's giving the bad end, it's good for both to remember that they owe their breath to God. Um, the poor and all who abuse them must each depend on God for life. I like uh, what the pulpit commentator wrote about it. He said, both rich and poor the oppressor and the oppressed owe their light and life to God. Here is comfort for the poor, that he has a tender father who watches over him and knows what's going on, that is. And here's a warning to the rich, that he will have to give an account of his stewardship. Uh, there are, what was it that Solomon said in the, uh, in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, if we see mistreatment, if we see injustice in a province, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. You know, we might look out, we might watch the news, or we might see in our local, I don't know if anybody has a paper anymore, but anyway, the idea of, of looking at, uh, at the circumstances that are around us on a local level, national level, world level, and we might just think things are in a mess. They are, but there be higher than they, and there is a God who's watching and in his time will answer. And that ought to be a, a sobering warning for those who are abusive and a comfort for those who are abused. In the 22nd chapter of Proverbs, we looked recently at this passage in verse 2. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. There are people excuse me, who because of their uh, position, because of the money they have, because of the power they wield, they think they are some sort of a special um, brand of human being. No, not really. Uh, you're just a man. You're just a human being, a person. And you're going to have to answer to God one day. And there are those who might feel like they're so low down that they're just forgotten, but they're not. Uh, and, and one day God... Uh, will likewise address their circumstance in his time. It reminds me a bit, maybe you too, of the passage over in Ephesians 5. 
uh, Ephesians 6, I should say. In, in at the time that the New Testament was written, certainly uh, there was a, a great and wide gaps in the social strata in Rome, and you had some uh, of great power and some of no power. And you had some that were masters and some that were servants. Uh, in, in, in the Word of God, the principles that are found there, I think, would call all men, wherever they were, to treat each other right. And really, independent of how they were treated, to treat the other fellow right. Uh, and when he addresses the idea of those who have the power, he says to them, Forbear threatening. Don't you dare threaten. Remember this, that your master also is in heaven, and there is no respect of persons with him. He's not impressed at all by your position, but he will remember the way you treat your fellow man. That's a lot of what this passage is about. It's about remembering the fact that uh, wherever we are on that scale, there is one above all men. All right, verse 14 comes to mind. <clears throat> The king that faithfully judgeth the poor, his throne shall be established forever. The king that faithfully judges the poor, his throne shall be established forever. We might uh, think that it would make more sense to say the, the king that gets along with his richest and most powerful servants is the man who will secure his throne. But that's not what he says. He says that you can judge and, and find the, the security going to the ruler, the person of authority, who is most careful for those who ultimately can't pay him back. Now, there's a, a statement of faith here about the providence of God, I think. The English Standard Version reads here, Steadfast love and faithfulness preserve the king, and by steadfast love his throne is upheld. Purge the wicked from the king's presence, and his throne will be established in righteousness. This is the idea of, of, of the king uh, being uh, upheld by his willingness to help those who are on the low end of the scale. Kidner summarizes the, the lesson here this way. The king who wins loyalty. That's who we're talking about. The test of a man in power and his hidden strength is the extent to which he keeps faith with those who can put the least pressure on him. That's a true man of principle. Uh, generally speaking, people are more careful for those who they think hold some power with them or over them. But if you find a man who will treat the fellow right, who is helpless before him, that's a man who has no self-interest in the matter other than the fact that he's a man of principle. And God blesses people of principle. That's what I believe our passage teaches. The just king does not discriminate against the poor. There is a time for discrimination. Uh, and I, I hope we all would recognize that. If... Um, you know, we, the, the word discrimination is a bad word, and it certainly can be uh, a very bad thing. But uh, sometimes we need to discriminate. If you're hiring a, a babysitter for your children, you certainly want to discriminate against pedophiles or people who have a, a violent criminal record or something of that nature. I think it's uh, only right to discriminate against certain behaviors. But uh, to discriminate against someone because they don't have a lot of money or because uh, of their age or something, whatever it might be that has nothing to do with their character, this is a very different story. And a wise king is a king who doesn't discriminate uh, against people uh, because of uh, how they look or uh, something of that nature, how much they have. He cares about them as much as anyone else. Faithful judgment that he talks about here. The duty of magistrates is to judge faithfully between the man and uh, his fellow and to determine all causes brought before them according to truth and equity, particularly to take care of the poor 
and not to countenance them in an unjust cause for the sake of their poverty. And then uh, Mr. Henry quotes from, uh, or references, I should say, Exodus 23. That is a, an interesting thing, isn't it? Uh, you remember that passage in the law? You know, the law has a lot to say about taking care of the poor and that God loves the poor and we ought to love the poor. But in uh, Exodus 23 and verse 3, Moses, God through Moses, reminded the judges of Israel, neither shall thou countenance a poor man and his cause. That is to say, don't look on a poor man and feel so sorry for him that you judge for him, he may not be right. You know, because a fellow is poor doesn't make him good any more than it makes him bad. Poverty is not in itself a virtue. Riches is not in itself a vice. Uh, I've got a friend of mine who, uh, through the years, has uh, uh, owned a trucks and so on, and professionally working trucks, and he would talk about if there was an accident involved on the highway, and you go to court, uh, the, 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 the big trucking company, that's the way they portray you anyway, is always wrong, even if they're not. We always feel sorry for the fellow down here. Maybe he was the one that caused the whole problem. Uh, you can't just assume because there's a big company, a little company, well, the little guy must be right. What the law says and what, what righteousness says is hear everybody out and judge fairly. And a king that does that will be blessed by God. And I tell you, wherever we are uh, on the scale and, and, and whatever authority we may have, again, whether it's in the church or it's in the home or it's at school or wherever it might be, being fair, being honorable, being people of principle, uh, like Mr. Cooley said years ago about obvious things, uh, if everybody would do those obvious things, how much better a world would it be? Uh, and of course, for those who don't, there have been way too many uh, peasants' revolts that have wound up toppling governments because people just did not trust the king's honor. Uh, ultimately, a fellow who thinks by grabbing power and threatening people he's going to hold his position, it may shorten his life in, in power, not, uh, not lengthen it. All right, verse 15 is a familiar verse to us. In this passage, the wise man writes, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Um, the rod and reproof give wisdom. Uh, there is a good deal about child rearing in the Proverbs. Uh, this passage uh, reminds us that discipline is the order of God's government and parents are his dispensers of it to their children. I think we could in a, put it another way. Uh, God uses parents, has put parents in place in order uh, to be the first authority. Children learn how to obey authority, how to submit, uh, how to yield their will, uh, first to their parents. When the parents fail, then the law has to get involved, and ultimately God Almighty gets involved uh, as far as, as the punishment is concerned. But it's our job as parents to, to restrain our children, to teach our children that uh, that the word no has a meaning. I think it's interesting too how the wise man talks about the rod and reproof. The rod obviously has something to do with corporeal punishment uh, and reproof has something to do with words of restraint and uh, words that uh, correct, words that hold back, uh, call back uh, children from certain types of behavior. Both are a part of child rearing according to the wisdom of God, and interestingly enough, both are condemned by modern wisdom. Uh, I didn't bring the books over here with me, they're over on the other side of the room, but uh, you know, I could read examples, and we have before in other passages like this from human wisdom, uh, in which uh, uh, people who are experts in child rearing, but ungodly, completely uh, uh, unattached. From the wisdom of God. In fact, they they're horrified uh, by the wisdom of God. They're they're so much smarter, you see, and they will advise parents 
uh, not to uh, raise their voice to their children. Uh, one that I heard on the radio lecturing here a number of years ago uh, was telling people, uh, try to do your best not to say no to your children. Um, uh, and that uh, they were advising, as I recall, that you ought to just go through the house, you know, and put up everything uh, that they might reach for so that you don't ever have to tell them no. Uh, they did make the, the, uh, the concession. They said, well, you know, you be, you'll be, might be a little bit busier. And I thought, you sure will. You'll be running yourself to death. You could do that, or you could just teach a child how to mind. Uh, it's a process, but, you know, children are smart. And uh, I remarked, and folks uh, more wise than myself certainly have made this point better, uh, one of the great tragedies with so many young parents is they assume their children are stupid. They're not. They're smart. They can learn. Uh, we've just got to be willing to teach them. And a part of that teaching process is correction. Part of that teaching process is warning, is rebuking. Uh, and uh, a part of that process involves uh, corporal punishment. The fact that the world uh, looks down on that is one thing. But it's very sad to me that some who claim to have a respect for God's will, likewise, uh, would uh, uh, condemn the idea of ever using corporeal punishment. Corporal punishment is, uh, uh, is something that certainly has to have a context. It, it certainly has got to be within the framework of uh, a loving parent, a parent who talks to their children, who shows them the way. And I recognize, and, and everybody listening to this who has had children has, has certainly learned this, that uh, just like people are different, adults are different, little ones are different. Uh, they're born different from each other. They each have their own personality. I believe in the power of nurturing children. I believe the Bible uh, would stand for that power uh, that we have as parents to try to shape our children and to shape their thinking. But it's also true that children don't start off at the same place. And you've got some children who are just born with a more compliant nature and some that are born with a more stubborn nature. Even in those cases, I had a, a fellow make a point many years ago with me that stuck with me. He said, you know, if you have a child who has a very strong will, as we sometimes say, if you can shape that will in the right direction, it becomes leadership. It's not a bad thing. Uh, it can be a great blessing, but it does have to be molded. But every child, you know, starts off with a personality, uh, and we work with that. The reason I bring all that up is somebody says, well, I think there are better ways than to use the rod of correction. Uh, spanking your children, so on. Uh, I, I will grant you the fact that there are some children who seem to need that kind of discipline more than others. Uh, there are some whom you can just show them a uh, hickory switch, and uh, that, that settles the matter. And some, it seems, you have to really work with uh, on the thing and repeat the lessons over and again. But in the end, I think it is uh, uh, settled by God that there's a place for this kind of punishment, there's a place likewise for reproof, and they work together, and that uh, it's not uh, uh, true wisdom to uh, look at the Word of God and to say, uh, well, the Lord just didn't know what he was talking about, or we've outgrown that, or something of that nature. People have not changed. Uh, families have not changed. And the truth is, uh, we need to discipline our children. We live in a society where... If, if parents punish their children uh, in a restrained way, we're not, we're not advocating abuse. We understand the difference between abuse and discipline. But parents even who discipline their children are, are under threat of the law. But if you let your kids run wild, then apparently that's not a problem. This is, this is madness. Be that as it may, uh, the rod and reproof give wisdom to the young. The former denotes bodily correction, what we call uh, corporeal punishment, uh, and uh, the latter discipline in words, rebuke, administered when any moral fault is noticed. What both of them call for 
is the attention of the parents, the priority of rearing your children, of, of teaching them uh, and, and correcting them early on. Another little piece of, of wisdom that was shared with me years ago that, that I found to be helpful, and I've shared it before, uh, I'm sure, with many of you. But uh, a question I had as a young parent was, when does this kind of corrective discipline begin? Um, at what point do you begin to you know, pop the hand of a little one? Uh, we, we know when our children are quite young, uh, they will be uh, getting towards something they ought not to touch, and we'll tell them no. And you tell them no, and they jerk that hand back, and they turn and look at you. And then they'll put their hand right back there again, see what you're going to do about it. So at what point do you begin correcting them in that way? And the best piece of advice that I, practical advice that I got was, you begin correcting them whenever they're able to understand the word no. And that comes pretty early. Pretty early on, children can understand the word no. And when they do, we begin to let them know that, uh, that you're not in charge here and that you're going to have to mind. And when mom or dad says no, that means stay away from that. Uh, the loving value of that is that we uh, have control of our children even if they are outside of our arms reach. <laughs> if I'm running after my children uh, every time I want them to come to me, uh, my children are not in control. They just they just not as quick as I am. Uh, that's not control. Uh, I, it's a form, I guess, of physical control, but it's not the kind of voice control that we're looking for. But whenever they are on the other side of the yard and we say come, uh, and they turn and come to us, uh, then then a lesson has been taught there at some point to where they understand. Even though I'd like to be over here looking at this. Mom or dad says, come, I've got to go. Uh, that's what discipline does. That's what the rod and reproof do, is they teach uh, that, that lesson, uh, that we've got to yield our will uh, to the one who's in authority. And the, the value of that is, uh, if I don't have my children in control, and I happen to look away for a moment and my child is heading toward a busy road, if they're of the nature and of the habit, every time I say, come here, they run as fast as they can the other direction. Well, now I've got a disaster on my hands. So it's best for the child. It's best for all that children learn discipline. And my point in all of this is that if I wait until they get to be about 12 or 13 to start uh, to teach them that they're not in charge, I'm waiting way, way too late. And uh, I may have, uh, have already set them up for uh, disaster. So parents learn uh, that educating their children is the primary thing. They must not only tell their children what's good and what's evil, but chide them and correct them too if need be when they either neglect that which is good or do that which is evil. The rod must never be used without a rational and grave reproof. And then, though it may be a present uneasiness, both to the father and the child, yet it will give wisdom. That's the promise. If you listen to the world, all these folks that write these books that talk about how that you ought never, never spank your children, don't, don't disagree with your children, uh, reason with a three-year-old, you know, and see if you win them over to your side, and all this kind of, that approach to child rearing. I've often thought, I'd like to see a picture of your kids. Uh, I'm not sure I'd like to be in the same room with them. I'd like to know what in the world happened. If they turned out to be good people, likely it's because somewhere down the line, somebody else taught them how to mind, and somebody else taught them about discipline. A child left to himself is the opposite of the child given the reproof and the rod. The child left to himself, the condition of one who has been pampered and indulged, the mother who yields weakly, We've all been in Walmart and seen the child just have the meltdown. You look at that child and you know good and well, that's not a happy child. That's a child that's miserable. Uh, because somewhere down the line, and maybe the parents just, maybe they just don't know how. I, I'm pulling for them. I'm not, I'm not trying to put them down. But I'm saying that the parent in that situation 
is not adding to the to the happiness of his child by just letting him do whatever he wants to do. Teach him how to mind at home. When he gets out away from home, he'll still know how to mind. When he forgets, correct him, remind him. Uh, and, and that really will make the child happier, certainly make the parents happier. And as years go by, if he continues in, in that vein, uh, then he'll bring a great deal of joy to his mother and father and not the kind of grief that this passage is warning about and that we've seen so many struggle with. Those who do not discipline their children suffer grievous embarrassment. Those who do will be at ease, able to trust their children, delight with the child's growth and accomplishments. Uh, one of the modern speech translations reads, The rod and reprimand impart wisdom, but a boy who runs wild brings shame on his mother, it should be. So, uh, make decisions now uh, that you'll be pleased with the fruit that's born uh, 12, 15, 18 years down the road. Adonijah is the classic example of that as we draw our lesson to a close. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 1, we read about uh, a rebel son of David, not Absalom. Absalom was another one, but this is Absalom's brother. Uh, and in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 5, it was Adonijah, uh, the son of Haggith. He exalted himself as his father was old and lying on his deathbed. He had already, David that is, had already chosen Solomon to be his successor. But Adonijah felt passed over, and he felt like it was in his power to take the throne, and uh, he had never uh, much considered that something he wanted uh, was either impossible or, or even out of the way. He said, I will be king. And he prepared chariots and horsemen to run before him. Verse 6, sadly, says that his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, What? Hast thou done? Uh, Adonijah did not find happiness and joy, and certainly didn't bring David joy. He was a, an unrestrained individual. And that lack of discipline in learning what the word no means, in learning how to submit his will, uh, shortened his life. Think about Proverbs 13 and verse 24. Whoso spares the rod hates his son, but he that loves him is diligent to discipline him. Or 23 and verse 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. You'll strike him with a rod and you'll save his soul from Sheol. Even a passage like uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11, uh, where the wise man is comparing, really, the disciplining and rearing of a child with God's working with us. And he makes the point that for the moment, all discipline, particularly he's talking about corrective discipline here, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but it later yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That's exactly right. And that's what the wise man was telling us here in Proverbs 29. He was telling us that the rod and reproof bring wisdom. And that lack of wisdom, because of the lack of those things that teach wisdom, will bring a lot of pain on the mother and the father, and many others as well, including the child. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us again this week, and uh, we hope to uh, see you again.